Morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this DocFest session on EU UK co productions after bre bre breakfast after Brexit. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, my name's Anna Mancy. I'm the head of certification at the BFI. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of an interesting and how to produce. Um, and literally very short, and then I'm going to hand over to Bridget O'Shea, who's going to do the panel with Estelle, Mario, and Charlie. So, just as an overview of co production, um, qualifying as an official co production is a way to access the UK tax release for film and television um, as an alternative to doing it as a cultural test project. Um, it's uh, UK co producers doing an official co pro can then uh, access the UK tax relief on any money that is used or consumed in the UK. And the UK, we have 12 bilateral treaties with the panels about co-production after Brexit. Our being a signatory to the European Convention doesn't change. The, the, the European Convention is a Council of Europe Convention rather than the European Union. So us leaving the European Union doesn't have any effect on us still being a signatory to the European Convention and us being able to co-produce with other European territories. There are already other European country, uh, well, territorial European countries such as Turkey and uh, Russia, who are signatories to the convention, who aren't in the European Union either. So we can still carry on doing co-productions with Europe. We can do treaty chaining. So if you wanted to do a UK or Canada co-production and do a European convention, you could join countries to do the two treaties together. Um, I'm sure most people are aware, but very brief overview of how co-production works. Um, the UK company in any involvement has to be responsible for all the UK elements, so engaging the cast crew, any post-production filming, etc., that's going to happen in the UK, and obviously the corresponding co-producer in another territory will look after their, their elements in their country. Um, the benefits of co-production are that you, it's a shared resource and a shared risk, and it means it can be a national film in more than one country, and that can help with distribution, of course, as well. Um, finally, the basic principles of co-production, each co-producer brings finance to the table and then they have a filmmaking or creative creation, which is broadly in proportion to that financial contribution. Most of the treaties, the minimum financial contribution is 20% and the maximum 80%. Obviously, with the convention, when you can have uh, three or more countries, that, that reduces to 10%. And with the UK-Australia treaty, um, the minimum is 30%. It's one of the older treaties, and we are aware that it's sort of, we need to sort of consider looking at that being refined. So that is a very, very brief run through. Um, I'm very happy to take questions at the end, or if anyone wants to get in touch with me, I'm sure Dr. Fest can pass on my details if anyone wants to know a bit more in depth on how to co produce. So I hope that was helpful, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the panel. And I will hand over to Bridget now. Thank you. Well, hello everybody. Welcome uh, to the Sheffield DocFest panel. Uh, I am really happy to be with you all this morning. Yet again, another session broadcasting live from my kitchen in Berlin rather than being together in the city of Sheffield, enjoying screenings and coffees and um, gin and tonics together in this glorious sunny weather. However, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try and keep connected and perhaps like you know, now Brexit is suddenly secondary to the pandemic, which will be secondary to some other crisis that we find ourselves in next year, because it seems like the one constant we have in documentary filmmaking is some kind of crisis. Um, I'm really happy to be with you here today on behalf of the Documentary Association of Europe. We're a newly founded network um, that has existed since February of 2020 um, to create an interconnected network of documentary filmmakers and professionals working across the globe who interact with European documentary in some form. So it might be that you're co-producing with European partners or showing your films at European film festivals or looking for distribution and education in our territories. For this reason, our network is actually open to anyone living anywhere in the world. We don't mind which passport you hold and we don't mind which country you live in. Um, we also cu curate and um, uh, negotiate on behalf of our members all kinds of special deals, including discounts for um, places like the European Film Market or um, the Cannes Doc every year as part of Marche du Film at the Cannes Film Festival. Also, Sheffield Doc Fest is one of our most recent members and partners 
and we're happy to be here sharing our knowledge and also two of our members on this panel. So interestingly enough, we're doing a talk today on the subject of co-producing with the UK. But as far as I know, and please correct me, Charlie, if I'm wrong, we don't actually have any UK citizens on this panel, which I think kind of shows one of the first challenges that is co-producing with the UK. And so what we're going to try and do today is talk in depth a little bit, not so much about the practicalities of um, co-producing or the kinds of um, criteria that you need to fulfill, but maybe more around um, questions of how do you find the right partners, how accessible are um, finances for UK European co-productions, and how can we maybe um, come to a place that despite Brexit and despite these challenges, we could be collaborating more together. So I have three great directors and directors slash producers here with me today. And I'm going to start with Charlie because you live in the UK. So it seems like a logical place to start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, please? Oh, I think you're muted or I don't have audio for you. Yes, indeed. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Bridget, for that. Um, yeah, so as you said, um, so my name is Charlie. I have been living in the UK for about 10 years now. I'm a permanent resident. This is my home. Um, I have a background in television current affairs. And about nearly three years ago, I embarked on my first feature documentary as a director, but very much involved on the producing side as well. And um, and the film's genesis kind of happened with a UK-based team, um, but you know, nearly three years down the line, it is effectively a German production <laughs> um, because uh, we have an amazing German co-producer who was able to get funding um, in uh, Germany to help um, bring us above the line in terms of making this film come to life. Um, and the film uh, follows a young uh, Syrian uh, swimmer, former swimmer named Sarah Mardini, as she fights against the trial that is accusing her of being a human smuggler, a money launderer, and a spy. And so she's fighting for justice while she's on a journey of self-discovery. That's a sort of quick synopsis. But um, we've been through, you know, all of the kind of UK funds for co-production and unfortunately have been unsuccessful. Um, that is not to say that we haven't received a lot of support from the UK industry. Um, and 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 there, are, you know, and, and I can elaborate further on, on that um, later on um, as we continue our chat because I think that's really important. Perfect. I think actually what you're describing is one of the key factors if we're going to have a kind of honest conversation today, which is that most documentary um, co-productions aren't actually uh, treaty co-productions at all. So you're, you say that the majority of the financing is coming from Germany, but you're still the producer of your film. How did you meet your German co-producer? How did this collaboration come apart, uh, come together? Sorry. Yeah, so the, the genesis of the film was was sort of uh, in the UK in the sense where the, the main producer who initiated it, Anna van Diemboska, is also a UK permanent resident, but not a citizen. Um, and uh, she, her and I, um, and another producer in the US kind of spent a year developing this film, um, getting access, getting development materials, going to labs. And finally at Doc Leipzig, um, at the co-production market, we were able to find an amazing German co-producer, uh, Antje Bomart, and um, all of our funding is coming from Germany. <laughs> we still have some gap financing, but we have enough to um, make the film, but effectively all of our funding is coming from Germany. And it's a testament to, Antje, our German co-producer, and her open-mindedness and her kind of flexibility as a producer to say, well, actually, you guys are still co-producers because this is a team joint effort. Um, but, you know, in our experience speaking to other producers, that isn't the case for most producers. So as UK producers who have not brought any funding to the table from our territory, we would have had a lot to lose effectively had we not been working with someone who was flexible and open to changing the official terms of a co-production. Co Super. So I think we can dig into that a little bit further uh, down the road. But now I would like to come to you, Mario, because 
Uh, you have co-produced co successfully with the UK, if I am correct. And would you like to yeah, introduce so, yourself? <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, Bridget, and sorry for cutting you off. Uh, yeah, so I'm Mario Adamson, and I'm producer at Sisyphus Film Production, and we co-produced our first, I mean, uh, bigger feature documentary with uh, Scotland. And um, yeah, we have both good and bad experiences. I mean, not bad, but I mean, we were in right in between the old system of the BFI and the new system. So we had in kind of this gap of communication, I think that was the biggest issue. But I mean, we managed to qualify both as a Swedish and a UK production due to the different point systems. So that's how we managed in a way to become both a UK and a Swedish production. Um, so, so that's where it started. And uh, now a couple of years, Later, we had uh, the opportunity to start working with Scotland again. So we actually opened a small, like Sisyphus Scotland br branch, or what you call it. So we're looking into, yeah, developing the collaborations with uh, UK creatives and um, both, I mean, directors, but also in the post-production parts a lot. Yeah, so that's where we are now. And even though your your previous film shot almost entirely in the UK with no no scenes in Sweden, this wasn't a problem for the Swedish Film Institute or Swedish television? Uh, uh, when we are a majority producer on where and how to spend the money and how to work with it. Whereas this, the Swedish television is much more focused on that Swedish, the film being a Swedish topic in a way. And that ended up us being, becoming some kind of pre-buy rather in a different department of the Swedish television rather than the one we were intended to, which would be much more money mm -hmm. um, for, yeah. So it's a little bit about this, how, how much, I mean, it's the same thing with BFI, I guess, that it has to qualify as some kind of related to the UK audiences and how um, important that they think it is for them. So it's kind of similar in this, in for the Swedish television. Mm -hmm. Whereas for the film, as I mentioned, it's a little bit much uh, more open um, on how to uh, collaborate and more flexible in the making of the film in that sense. Great. And Thank I mean, you so much. the way the reason it qualified as a UK uh, topic was that, I mean, we shot in UK, the main protagonist was uh, Scottish. Um, the story was set there, but the directors were not from there. So yeah, that's kind of, and we did all the post-production there as well, so. Super. Thank you so much. So Estelle, you are like a very experienced producer, very experienced making many projects in many different places with many different directors over the last years. Can you tell us also a little bit about your experiences working with UK based productions? Have you co-produced with the UK before? Um, yes, hello everyone. Uh, I met um, through Justin Muller, I have to call his name here. Um, I met uh, Elham Shakarifar about eight years ago as she was uh, producing Said Taji Farouki's film, The Runner, at the time, uh, which she had pitched at Doc Leipzig. So we're back to Doc Leipzig again. Um, I met Elham. Uh, she's a perfect, perfectly francophone. Uh, we had instant uh, connection um, and, and desire to work together. Um, and on the runner, I co-produced it. It was not an official co-production, and I think I raised something like forty thousand euros in France. So it was a small budget film, um, shot partly in France because the runner uh, lives in France, the, the marathon, the long distance runner, um, in the film. Um, and forty thousand euros at the time for the film was quite a big amount of money for them because they were really struggling financing it in the UK. 
after that one, we tried one swing site to uh, co-produce again, and I didn't manage to raise funds. Another time with Elum. Um, and finally, now I've been producing Said's film, a new film for the last five years. And it's a French, uh, Swiss, Dutch, and Palestinian to some extent uh, co-production. And it's not a co-production with the UK, unfortunately, because only the director is from the UK initially. Mm -hmm. um, but we have actually um, worked with the sound designer, James Bully. Uh, we have uh, asked from some creative talent from the UK to come into the production because uh, we would love to have more <laughs> UK talent in the film. Um, but the structure was complicated uh, because of it. So that's uh, mm -hmm. the facts for now. I mean, I don't want to be all doom and gloom about this because what we're also talking about is a private reality. But I also feel like now after, you know, like, what is it, nine months plus a pandemic, it's very, very difficult to talk about like contemporary case studies also because we haven't really had enough time to test these new models. But I'm wondering, Mario, could you talk a little bit more about your um, your uh, motivation to op open a new office in Scotland, despite you guys describing these extremely challenging circumstances for co-producing with the UK? I mean, the reason for us was uh, through the Skimbers, we, I mean, we met some great um, people we want to work with. And uh, we've also had uh, Clara Harris being uh, living in Sweden the one and she moved back to Scotland quite recently so for us it was more in a natural way of okay how can we continue working with her and also Scotland is a little bit different as I understand from uh, the rest of the UK regarding funds et funding etc so it made sense in trying to see how to engage that region both going in financing and uh, to develop Clara as a junior producer. So, I mean, that that's the main reason for us doing this. But then also, I mean, I think we have, as you all mentioned, it's like challenges in how to finance things. And we really also see that some projects tend to talk, speak to um, people in certain regions. So we also think that, okay, some of our projects are more likable in the anglophone <laughs> how you call it in the anglophone areas and and it would make sense to have perhaps a uk um, main production thought around the structure of the financing so mm -hmm. i mean that's the core of, um, of course i mean even for even in sweden we have it's hard sometimes to get the money for all the projects because it's not the perfect fun one or whatever and i mean if if the commissioners in the end don't like the project it doesn't matter how much you fight to get it done it's like you have to find other ways so this is one more way for us to just to try see uh, how how we can work with the people we want without being really strict restricted just to to our areas yeah yeah yeah. So Estelle, as somebody who does co-produce quite frequently and has done more more than one of these larger multinational uh, uh, kind of financing plans, how like what percentage of those do you think are treaty based co-productions versus non treaty based co-productions? Sorry, you mean in the ones that do take place over the year? Or? That, no, that you have made yourself because what I'm trying to get trying to d explore is you know do we really need as documentary filmmakers treaties in order to co-produce with each other um not uh, France is divided between cinema and audiovisual productions so for cinema mm -hmm. co-productions you would actually need uh, to officialize them um in your own country before you can actually let your partners access their funds. I mean, they can have the funds, but if they want to actually cash the money, they need um, the co-production to be uh, official. And for audiovisual productions, a lot of them are not actually official treaty co-productions. We just 
make them. With some countries like Canada, you do have to officialize them. With others, you don't. Uh, so I would say maybe 20% need to be official. I mean, mm -hmm. that's because you want a number. I haven't done the, the figures. Um, but to me, it shouldn't be... Um, it shouldn't be a, either a handicap or an opportunity. That's a kind of a technical detail. And the reason why I go into a production is absolutely, of course, you, you look at what finance is available and what structure is available, but mostly you look at the talent and the and what film we can actually embark on together. And for mm -hmm. some reason, there are less projects. I meet less projects from the UK and less teams from the UK wanting to co-produce than even from Eastern Europe or even from Africa. So it's something strange happening that we can dive into. <laughs> yeah, Charlie, it's, it seems like you have something to say on this. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say as a team, uh, the team behind the film we're making, we tried to kind of uh, co-produce on a different film. And in that case, we were quite realistic that based on our experience of the past three years, you know, we approached the co-producer and we said, listen, we have all of this to offer, but we know that our ability to access national funds that would back us is very limited. Um, do you want to collaborate? <laughs> and it's not, I mean, it's not a strong sales pitch. And as a team, we kind of had to, Look, look at our, you know, what we were really offering, and unless the person is on the other side is really sold by the story and us, you know, and, and they, they have to take a huge leap of faith and go above and beyond then to pull a lot of the financing weight to make the film happen. Um, I understand that as a as a UK outfit, we don't feel like we're in a position of strength necessarily in approaching mm -hmm. um, certain European countries, and so perhaps. Perhaps that explains <laughs> um, the the kind of the, the lack of um, and um, I don't uh, yeah that's that's the best explanation I have from our experience. <laughs> well, I mean, actually, one of the one of the things that you all have in common, um, or well, Tally, it was your producer in this case, but um, was that you have all attended also the workshop of Eurodoc, which also um, kind of suggests that in in there are also like you know not every production company not every producer film production is ever produced the same way you know we all have our natural interests and stuff but as like very open-hearted open-minded collaborative individuals it does seem like a shame to be cut off from you know our neighbors across the pond but do you think that you have any other than of like the the fi financial reality of producing in the UK, Charlie, do you see any other kind of barriers that stop UK European co-productions? I mean, I think that's the main one. Because on the flip side, I was going to say we have found a lot of support from people like the Wickers Fund or the Malik Fund, who I know are more international but have a bit of a UK presence, and you know, um, obviously Eurodoc and all of these. Um, places that we've been able to go and people we've been able to meet along the way have been really supportive. Um, I think that the, the the main thing is the the funding structures, which prevent us not only from bringing funding to the table, but Estelle kind of mentioned this earlier, um, also prevent us from working with UK talent that we might want to collaborate with um, to, to make the films, uh, to make the films. So there's plenty of people I'd love to work with here, but, but because of the funding structures, we're we're very restricted um, as well. So I would say, yeah, funding and then what, what the implications of funding is, um, which is the, the talent pool that we have access to. And I think, sorry, but just to add to this, for coming from France, uh, from a country where historically we are known for needing very long written applications for funds, it's so different to what uh, the requirements from EFI or Doc Society would be for an English uh, treatment, uh, you know, uh, the way of presenting the film are very different. But I think um, and that's definitely um, something that would stop both sides from going towards each other. And also the technicalities of co-productions probably scare people off because, yes, it is a lot of bureaucracy, uh, a lot of rules to follow, and it's it's really stopping sometimes creativity, it's stopping the movement, you know, but at the same time, if you actually manage to spend a um, good time 
times and actually find the bridge, it can actually create something magic because there's like so many good things to put together. And we need, I mean, I've become better at writing applications for and getting the funds for whatever, Bertha or Sundance or Hot Dogs. And, and at the same time, I know how to accompany a writer to write something more developed. And I think we can both learn from each other a lot if we can take the time and find the right uh, project. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because there is sometimes, I think also things happening on the continent, you know, there's 330 million Europeans in 30 something countries. I can't remember now exactly how many, 33, I think is recognized by media and we speak also 27 languages. So like we have our system going on and then we have the English language system, which connects both North America, the UK, and I guess Australia and New Zealand. And because like of my nationality being Australian, I sometimes see the bridge and perhaps find it too impossible. But Mario, in your case with Screenbirds, you had money from France with Arte, if I am correct. And you had also your Swedish partners and your British partners. So how do you balance yeah. these three different film languages, these three different cultures, three different attitudes to cinema, etc.? <laughs> how i balance we try to make good <laughs> films that <laughs> isn't that the core uh yeah uh, that's a tricky question how to balance i mean it i mean you really just have to i mean at, in in the core of it i guess that even the funds and everybody that works with giving us money they love cinema and love filmmaking and etc so i mean the most important thing for us have been just communicating talking talking and meeting and i mean and step by step you get closer and you get to understand the differences um i mean our work has been really much to protect in a way the directors and the film when we did Skin Birds, for example, because both art are really strong in what they want and uh, the BFI were also, you know, had the requirements. So, I mean, Sweden, I would say, was the least problem of how the film should be done. While as in France and UK, we had to be much more, um, they expected much more communication from us. But I mean, as I mentioned, also, we ended up being in between in the two in the system shift in uh, with the BFI and the Doc Society. So that really complicated because, I mean, we had to give reports, but they never reported back back then. But I mean, things, all these things have been sorted out now, I guess. So uh, I wouldn't say that that would be the main issue for most productions working with them. Um, I don't know if that was an answer to your question, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's I mean, like, regarding bring, that, yeah. All right, I was just going to say, you bring up an interesting work because all of these, or an interesting point, which is because all of these documentary films that are always financed in these different and kind of fragile ways, I suppose you do find yourself doing this kind of pioneer work where you are suddenly in the middle of a system change or you're putting together partners that have never worked before is this something that you think is like quite common for your other productions regardless of whether or not they're UK co-productions yeah I mean uh, sorry I missed that part I think it's just hacked if you just can repeat the question one oh, in short. sorry um, we, so do you think that like this kind of pioneer work or working under these circumstances where every every project is different is also common even if the UK isn't involved as a co-production partner. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, uh, and I mean all the pro I mean I I I assume you agree with me Estelle and Charlie but every project I mean is so different and the combinations are so different and the perspectives are also so different. So I think every film has these crucial points where you really need to find the right person for the right uh, thing at the right moment. 
And at mm -hmm. those moments, I think it's most important that you feel the support of your national funds or the partners you already know. And I mean, so, so, and if you don't have that base there, then I think um, that creates the biggest issues, I guess, in, in the um, motion of the project further. Uh, I, I, th I mean, if we talk about differences, I mean, we, we have a long, really long development period for our projects in Sweden, wireless in France, I understand, and UK, it's, I mean, it's, it's total different. So it's a little bit like we need, I mean, we're premiering Ali Bulala in three days and we get the production, um, what you call it, the final production stamp next week, the week after. So it's, we're really, really much more in, in this development phase. So we can work on it in a way, but it makes also com more complicated to make the deals with France, for example, or, or UK when we have to move into production earlier, et cetera. So, so it's things, things like that that's more complicated in a way, as I see it at this point. Yeah. Hey, Charlie. Yeah. Charlie, go for it. Sorry, just to add, I mean, to what Mario said from our personal experience, it was really interesting because the first year, I would say, we had no clue what we were doing. And I, I was kind of basing myself on my background in more television, current affairs. And Anna, our producer, was more based on her background in drama. So we were kind of cobbling together these applications that, in hindsight, you know, we're not at all <laughs> part of the requirements and we're very, um, very UK centric as well. Um, and then I remember we went to hot docs and kind of pivoted towards more what North America would expect uh, or what we thought North America would expect. And then went to Doc Leipzig and by having our, our German co-producer that, you know, things just start shifting a lot. The, the way the budgets are made, the way that you kind of do your treatments, the way you're your deck changes. And so we've seen these kind of three major shifts. Um, mm -hmm. And then it got very G German, but does that work for then applying to the BFI the third time around? <laughs> or do we then have to review it and look at it with a British lens again? Um, so so we've seen the materials really make these big shifts to say, okay, what what is expected? Um, you know, and, and not in a dramatic way, the essence of the film stays the same, but, but how it's presented and um and and what kind of things are, are expected of it so um so that's been a real learning curve and and, it, and that just comes with experience and when i think that when we came to this to, to start this film for the first year we had nobody who actually knew what they were doing and when you finally do get a producer who's been navigating this maze for a long time and understands also what different territories might expect like knows the maze beyond their own territory but knows the european landscape it makes such a difference and it you know and and that's invaluable um so yeah and i think that the, the pioneering uh aspect that you mentioned and the learning curve that you're talking about charlie is is great for all of us we need those phases there are like in some ways development phases in themselves because we're developing the project and we're developing our own experience and knowledge but what would be great is that we could capitalize on this and, and have more co-productions with the same partners, for instance, and the Nordic countries tend to, if it's still the case, but to say, okay, we uh, promote, um, um, what they call it, reciprocal co-production or, you know, that yeah. you, once you're a minority, once you're a majority, and they really want to push this. And I think the French system is quite also supportive of, of, of co-productions and we do have lots of rules, but we also welcome directors from all over the world and it's a matter of expenses and creative talent, but we can work around those things. I just feel like, and maybe it's just a pure ignorance, but getting uh, funds from the UK through Doc Society or BFI is something that's very agile and I feel like the funds are changing and they're um there's no set things for like the rest of the century like they would be maybe in france even though it's changing but it's hard to understand exactly how it works or what's going to be there next year it's how to understand how the control test point test system works and so it's hard mm -hmm. to also build on an experience and to and to imagine that we could create partnerships long-term part partnerships so it doesn't really promote that desire <laughs> to co-produce. 
And this is actually, this is one of the... Oh, no, please, Charlie, you go first. Please, please. Oh, I would say, I mean, what that what that can result in is be very discouraging at a moment where your motivation is your biggest um, cachet. And, and where the big difference is, is um, actually receiving feedback from these funds when you are unsuccessful. Because though we were unsuccessful with the Wicker Awards, for example, they were very, um, they were incredibly supportive. And I would say that they were pivotal to the survival of our film and, and of our team mm -hmm. and, and everything because the team uh, behind the wickers took the time and and, and to, to engage with us, um, I think that makes a really big difference um, so that you know how to move the, the dialogue further for films in the future and, and just feel like that there's something more sustainable uh, moving forward. Just to speak to what Estelle was saying. Yeah, and I gave a lot of pitch training and one of the most useful pieces of... Um, advice I received from somebody who was giving me pitch training at the beginning of, of my career was that, you know, when you're just always rehearsing for the next pitch, right? So like, you know, when you're trying something out, you're trying and if it's unsuccessful, you do, you know, adjust and change and shift and hope that it will be better. And in some senses, there's, I don't, I, or at least in the years that I organized a co-production market and in the 15 years that I've been helping facilitate producers and filmmakers find each other in this crazy world and funders find each other. I've never known like somebody to meet immediately and they have one meeting and that's it and the deal is done. So you need options, you know? We need these access points to each other where we can discuss things and it's not about, you know, necessarily nailing down a deal in that first meeting, but having insights and opportunities to, to discuss ideas and to discuss, yeah, the, either the rigidity or flexibility of systems, you know, because they should be flexible. And and um, again, like the entrepreneurial spirit of documentary filmmaking for me is always making impossible things happen against the rules rather than by adhering to the rules. But I think like what I'm really hearing now is that also, you know, from when I was working for the film festival in Germany, we would be in qu quite close contact and dialogue with the UK media desk, with the Creative Europe desk, who would invite people from the continent to come to the UK. Because it also has to be in the same way that, you know, we go to Eastern Europe or we go to the post-Soviet context or we go to Latin America to find, you know, interesting projects to collaborate with or to co-produce on. The access to the, the UK Okay. And it can't always be in the formalized framework, I guess, of the meat market and also Sheffield Docfest or Open City Docs in London shouldn't have to carry the, the, the entire burden, let's say, of like doing this matchmaking in order to facilitate um, co-productions. When I think about, you know, Franco-German relations, for example, Estelle, you know, we have meetings for just the two countries where we can speak just German or French. Or in the Nordic countries, of course, you know, I know that Nordic Panorama is currently really at risk, but, you know, we have more, let's say, I don't want to say lower stakes, but like more relaxed opportunities to meet each other and to have inter-European dialogue with each other to facilitate these kind of matchmakings. But maybe that's something that's really missing also to help us meet each other because, Charlie, you said also you had to go abroad to meet your partners, if I'm correct. Yeah, 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 no case. <laughs> and, and have you been involved in any matchmaking in the UK? Like um, in the UK, I mean, you mentioned uh, Open City Doc Fest, and they were amazing. We were we were able to um, be part of their uh, inaugural assembly lab, and that made a huge difference to our our film. And I think was probably the most, um, one of, yeah, like a milestone in, in the process for us. Um, so, uh, you know, but but it's interesting. I mean, yeah, we met, that's where we meet incredible creatives who back us. So, so I think we felt very backed by certain individuals and all of that. It's just the more, um, the ability to bring money to the table, <laughs> which has been, which has been lacking on our part rather than, um, access to kind of industry representatives who 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 editorially at least really helped us yeah a lot 
So Estelle, if you had like, before I open it up to the audience for questions, also just as a reminder, like please, if you're in the audience, feel free to shoot us questions. We have a secret help sending us read them out. But before, while you're thinking about your questions and posing them, Estelle, if you had one wish to make UK, your, or let's just narrow it down to France because Europe is also a big place, for more French, UK co-productions, what would your wish be? Um, I guess maybe that uh, the funds open up for minority uh, co-production fund, or I can see that um, there's a, I can't remember the call for a fund to really uh, help the industry in the UK uh, structure itself and, and get stronger. And I think that's fabulous. And I think part of it, an industry getting stronger is also having uh, one of the tools is uh, to be given uh, opportunities to co-produce and maybe not just in the because I mean we can't say that this hasn't been co-productions of course there have been and there have been major like Arte, BBC co-productions with French and English producers for instance and there have been things like that but I, I'm coming from the creative documentary point of view maybe the smaller budgets like under under 600,000 euros you know and I think if we could have um flexible funds to co-produce, uh, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Mario, do you have another wish? No, I, I will probably just uh, agree with Estelle that it would be great for all in funds to be a little bit more flexible on the co-production levels, because I think that would help so much more to uh, any production on how to spend the money, where to go and do it. And uh, I think that in the end, I mean, even if one film or one country ends up doing one, some stuff more in a different region, if we have this more open collaboration, the next film would be the other way around. So in that yeah. aspect, I think that um, it's it would be much better to be a little bit more open and a little bit more flexible on how these spends should be done, et cetera, just to get better films done easier in a, in a way. Yeah, I think that's, <laughs> and that doesn't go only for the UK. I think that's, I mean, as a majority Swedish, I can do a lot uh, with the funds I get, but as a minority, I'm really, really restricted to. So I think that would be something really to look at as uh, minority co-producers on how to collaborate uh, yeah and I feel Charlie I feel like I can summarize which is one feedback on applications that are not successful and two make funds more available <laughs> but if you yeah, would like to add definitely. anything else I mean, I, I understand that funds are obviously limited in, in, in resources as well and probably don't have time to give feedback to everyone who applies. Um, but I, I think that, you know, what what happens is when you're unsuccessful three times over and you and, you know, you've been to all the labs and you feel like you've, you know, you know your whole pitch has finally reached its apex and, and all that. It really just getting a flat rejection just makes you undermine your ability to make the film or your your filmmaking style and so I, I think it would make a really big difference to have yeah that that kind of feedback process or, or dialogue um uh for for certain films that you know um may 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 be getting a lot of support you know um from from continental europe um and the eu i i also had uh, the impression that maybe i'm wrong but that uh, language isn't a factor in supporting films or in the point system or um, I don't know if any of you know, I don't want to say anything that is wrong or maybe someone hearing me can say, no, it's not true. But I had a feeling that uh, it's actually a number, an important number of points for documentary that it's English spoken. And I think that for documentary, if that's the case, it doesn't make sense. I mean, in England, there are so many communities so many languages and around the world of yeah. course as well and i think language shouldn't be um, a criteria i, I think in, you know in documentary in france it's not a criteria i totally 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 agree i couldn't agree more because also this is one of the issues like that we you know we haven't even talked about broadcast television and when i think about the uk broadcast television landscape 
for creative documentaries in particular, I just like, it's like my body freezes because it's so, such a difficult landscape to work in. And I'm so impressed by the producers and directors managing to do that in a, like in a meaningful way. And so, yeah, without the partners also beyond the film funds, of course, like it's really hard if you have a broken chain or you don't have a healthy ecosystem that, you know, recognizes all these different kinds of forms that nonfiction filmmaking can take and work in. Of course, it's the great luxury of the, of the Nordic countries of Germany and, and France and Italy, even if things aren't perfect, you know, we at least have options which is very for us. And, you know, with all of the English speaking planet and with, you know, all, all of these communities and the incredible melting pot that the UK is, like it would be wonderful, wonderful to have more access to these stories without a doubt. So I'm going to bring Anna back in one, one minute because um, she would like to talk about the UK Global Screen Fund, which is very nice to hear that we haven't sent her away as documentary filmmakers tend to do sometimes. Um, but so Malcolm asks a question, which is, can you please talk a bit about legal costs as a product, as a proportion of production bu budgets for each co-producer and how does that impact on a lower budget creative? Did you understand my question? I feel like I might have mumbled it. I don't know. Does Estelle or Mario, would one of you like to answer that? I, I, I'm not sure why this question is specifically on legal costs and maybe the person means like the extra cost of co-producing i don't know and yeah. the average the average percentage we cannot say i think it's more or less 20 percent more expensive to co-produce <laughs> it raises costs like legal costs or bank costs or translation costs of course uh, it's more expensive to co-produce we have our legal in, internally, so it's part of our overall. So I'm not sure exactly how to answer this question, but um, overall co-producing costs more money for sure, about 20%. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean I the legal costs. Yeah. No, please, you go, 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 go. There's a delay between Mario well, I and I, which is why we keep uh, yeah, from, from, for us, I mean, the legal costs are, it really, really depends on the project. Um, but we have, I mean, we need to have our insurances. We need to have uh, some basic and, and, and that's a percentage of the total budget. So it depends on, on what it, but it's around two or three percent just for the um, uh, production insurance. And then we have on top of that, depending on what kind of project it is. I mean, some projects are really, really expensive because the topic is so difficult and then we need to spend a lot of money on that. And on other ones, it's much simpler. So it's really hard to say an overall number for me. Yeah. I would also say, uh, just to add, like if it's about legal costs between like um that are involved with like the fact that two co-producers are collaborating like there are ways if you're starting at a low budget there are ways to kind of manage that with you know starting with memorandums of understanding or deal memos and then sort of working up to like proper contracts but you know um i think that um building trust between two co-producers is so important and i don't know how often it breaks down or anything in our case we were very lucky that, that it's been a you know a very fruitful marriage as you say but um deal memos and then working your way to contracts and, and sort of building that rapport have all been very important to and, and and on the flip side have kept legal costs a bit lower because you're not you know you're you're on the same page um much more than not maybe charlie i have one more question so as you said um earlier you had a steep learning curve when you came into this co-production um, space so who has helped you learn about these deal memos and um, helped you understand kind of your both your obligations and your requirements that you have to fulfill to be a good co-production partner I think um, being part of you know um, um, industry organized things like Eurodoc and different pitch forums um, has, has been huge um, because you benefit from very intensive mentorships from lots of industry peers. And then, of course, you know, our German co-producer has kind of taken the time and has had the patience to sort of break things down for us, which um, 
which has been really nice um, on her part to kind of explain how it how it could work. So, um, and uh, that's that that's been our luck, I think, to to find a partner who who had that kind of patience as well. I think this is really really a good place to bring. Um, Anna back and to end this part of the discussion which is also that like co-production and working internationally it's also it's a different um, system and so it requires you to like learn the system and a lot of people start out with no idea and it's also not the natural production that you learn in film school so in the same way that um, like like when I'm helping people enter this so-called international market, you know, when, you know, if you are applying for ID for Form, if you're applying for the Doc Leipzig co-production market or CPH Docs, often the best place to start is actually with a training initiative, you know, with the SDI, for example, Scottish Documentary Institute offers really nice courses on these kind of things each year or Eurodoc if you're really like m making that step into the, the feature length films that require an international co-production is a great, great place to start. And um, Sheffield Dogfest used to have a producer's training, but I think that that program has come to an end. So I just think this idea of, of education is really important also because we need to be speaking the same language and we need to understand what um, the other <laughs> producer is banging on about when they're talking about contracts. And it's really not self-evident that you learn that in film school or know from the beginning. Certainly, I had a job for two years without understanding what a sales agent was, and I was too shy to ask what they did. And so there are no, like, like stupid or uneducated questions. It's just a different language that we're talking. So, again, I think that training is always a great place to start to build these bridges and the networks that you then collaborate with you know, for the next 20 years in reciprocity, as Estelle was mentioning. So, Anna, I would like to actually give you the final word um, because you wanted to tell us about, if I'm not incorrect, the Global UK Screen Fund. Oh, you just need to unmute yourself, please. We don't hear you. Sorry, I was trying, I just thought I'd actually managed to do it correctly for once. It's been a really interesting discussion and, you know, Estelle, I think you touched upon, we, we may have a fund, and that is the UK Global Screen Fund that we have, uh, the BFI's just launched, is not run out of my department, but there is an, an international co-production um, strand and it will support um, UK co-producers joining international co-production projects and that goes across documentary, animation, feature, and majority and minority projects. Um, but, and films don't have to be made with an official treaty. I know, obviously, I did the uh, overview of how you do an official co-production co treaty, but it could be that it, it's an unofficial project and you qualify under the cultural test. And we're very happy to advise, but, you know, the participation team's always been happy to talk people through projects and what's the best option for them, whether it's cultural test or COBRA. But all the information on the UK Global Screen Fund is, is now on our website and the International Strand, I think, is opening later on in the month. I don't want to say it in case I get it wrong, the yeah, uh, date's wrong, um, but all of that will be in on our website and available for people. So, and they, they're spending a lot of time to make sure that it fits with these kind of projects. You know, it's really important that we carry on working together and co-producing together. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I guess I'll just try and wrap up for the last uh, few minutes. Also, because there's a message from the UK production company Clover Films, who says they're very happy to chat about uh, UK-based co-production in case you're looking for a British partner. Um, it's nice to see that these languages are available and open. But I think what I'm hearing is we need more access to each other. So we need to be able to meet each other um, in this new Brexit reality. We need more flexibility, of course, from um, the funding systems on both sides to find some kind of model that is compatible with each other. Um, we need feedback especially for up and coming talents um, as they're going through the process of um, applying for these kind of funds or working with these kind of partners. 
from both sides, I would say, as Estelle correctly pointed out, the expectations of the French film funds are totally different to the British film funds, are completely wildly different from the German film funds, even though France and Germany share a broadcaster, for example. And also, we need to make sure that we're working in an intact audiovisual chain so that there's television, there's theatrical, there's digital, and of course, um, you know, the government subsidies that are, you know, our right as tax paying citizens um, in our nation states. So I would really like to thank um, the three panelists for being here today with us, Estelle, Mario and Charlie, especially for maybe saying in a public space some uncomfortable truths about what's happening in our worlds at the moment. And um, I really hope that we can meet together soon in the real world. And also to Anna Mancy for taking the time from the BFI to tell us more about how we can um, work together despite these Brexit conditions. I also say thank you very much. Um, I can only encourage you, but I am very biased as that one of the co-directors of the Documentary Association of Europe to join our network. Um, it's a nice place to be and if you would like to be in contact with us at any time you can check out our website uh, which I think is actually linked on the Sheffield Dogfest um, website because we are now partners and we're very happy to have Sheffield Dogfest as our members too and so I wish you a fantastic day I hope it's as sunny wherever you are as it is here in beautiful Berlin and yeah, I'm here's to more co-productions and more collaborations. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye guys. Have a good day.